world is changing fast. New technologies are impacting how we think about products, services, and the way we live our lives. Nowhere is this trend more present than in financial services, where new business models and customer expectations are changing our conceptions about banking, finance, and the very nature of money. Welcome to ReBank, a visionary podcast about banking, fintech, and the future. The future of banking is here. Hello and welcome to ReBank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. Today we're thrilled to be joined by John Stein. John is the CEO and founder of Betterment, one of the leading robo-advisors in the U.S. After amassing a number of years of experience advising banks and brokers on risk and products, John founded Betterment in 2008 to make people's lives better. John is a graduate of Harvard University and Columbia Business School. He holds Series 7, 24, and 63 licenses and is a CFA charter holder. John's interests lie at the intersection of behavior, psychology, and economics, all of which we get into in today's conversation. If you enjoyed today's episode, we have a request for you. We'd really appreciate it if you shared it with one other person. FinTech is relevant all over the world, and we'd love your help spreading the message. Thank you very much for listening today. Please welcome John Stein. John, welcome to ReBank. Well, thanks for having me. Great to be here with you. So describe Betterment for those that don't know it. Betterment is excellent financial guidance that's accessible to anyone. We manage your money for you. We optimize and automate everything that you should be doing with your money to make the most of it and keep you on track to the most important financial goals in your life. It's, uh, it's that dream of, wow, uh, I just wish my money was working harder for me and, and I could get it all for real cheap and, uh, and make more of my money. Uh, it's that dream realized. So actually, I, sh- I should probably run some terminology by you real quick before we, we really get going. Robo-advisor is kind of the term that's used to describe this space. Now, people have different feelings about it. Are you comfortable with me referring to Betterment as a robo-advisor? Sure. All right. So you started Betterment uh, years ago, uh, way before robo-advisory was a thing. Where did the idea come from, and how did the company come together? You know, uh, often uh, uh, people like to say there was a single, you know, lightning moment, uh, and, and, it's, and it's fun to tell stories in, in that way. Uh, but there were a lot of uh, experiences along, along the, the, the course of my life that influenced me and kind of made, made this possible. Um, so uh, in a lot of different ways to tell the story. Um, from a, if I tell the short version, um, I got interested in, uh, in behavioral economics uh, in college, in my Freshman year, I took economics. It's a it's the biggest class. It was the biggest class at, at Harvard at the time. Uh, it was about a thousand people out of a class of sixteen hundred that took it, uh, and it was with this professor Martin Feldstein, who uh, was one of Reagan's economic advisors, was a conservative clearly, and uh, and and was a rational markets kind of guy. And, and I loved uh, the macro side of, of economics and still love it, uh, you know, still, still read The Economist and um, love, love it as a lens to understand the world. Uh, it explains economies, it explains how countries work and the incentives that, uh, that on a macro scale that, that drive uh, progress and, and change and, and, and policy. And then uh, in the second semester, I, uh, we, we moved to micro, same professor, and and micro was wholly unsatisfying to me, microeconomics. Uh, microeconomics is the story of individual purchase decisions, individual incentives or firm incentives. Uh, and it just, it didn't seem to me to, to explain as well like why people did what they did, or it seemed to leave something out. Uh, and I got that extra something from a human behavioral biology class that I was also taking in the spring semester of my freshman year. That class was taught by Irvin DeVore, who was uh, uh, this amazing professor, full of great stories. He talked about his youth growing up in southern Louisiana and drinking pearl beer in the, the back of his dad's pickup. And he talked about getting struck by lightning in Africa and just had, uh, had, had wild, interesting stories about 
what drives people. Uh, he studied people. Uh, he, he was an anthropologist and studied uh, the fact that we often uh, rationalize decisions after the fact. We make them based on, on other, you know, more emotional motives and then rationalize them later. And this is now very much part of popular wisdom or, or popular psychology because we have Dan Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow and we have uh, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein's Nudge. And uh, there's lots of uh, uh, awareness uh, of, of behavioral economics. But boy, I, there wasn't as much of it in, in 1997 when I was taking this class. And uh, I was just uh, enthralled with the idea of bringing together, on the one hand, if we make rational decisions, the world is a better place. There's more efficiency. Uh, there's more to go around. People are happier. On the other hand, we're really bad at making great decisions. And, and so I wanted to help people make better decisions. And um, there's not an obvious career path in that. Uh, it wasn't clear to me how to how to do that. It just felt like a, a, a goal. And um, I thought for a while I might want to be a doctor. And I thought just, you know, helping individuals with, with health decisions was would be a fulfilling career. I just, when I was volunteering in the hospital and in the labs, I, I realized they didn't like blood and I didn't want to be, just felt like not a very uh, personally, um, you know, uh, satisfying. Although in some sense, the mission was right. The day to day of it wasn't, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was tough. And, and I didn't feel like I could have the impact that I wanted to have going down that route. Um, I was in the hospital and I wanted to be fixing the hospital. I wanted to fix the system, not the individual case. I wanted to have bigger impact. And uh, to me, that meant maybe business, whatever business was, and, and I didn't have any experience in business, but um, I knew that I had liked, say, uh, running the newspaper in high school and running the, the grill uh, in my, in my uh, university dorm. And, uh, and I liked bringing people together and, 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 and organizing things and, and, and making a company. Uh, and so I thought maybe I'd like that, but I didn't know where to start. And then I got my start in, uh, in financial services, consulting to banks. Uh, so this short story is becoming long, and I apologize. <laughs> it's off to a great start. Good. Uh, we, uh, I sort of happened into financial services consulting. I used to say that my job was, was helping the banks make more money, uh, which was not a very um, you know, satisfying thing to be doing. But I was uh, on a day-to-day -day sort of personal level, I was loving learning so much, working with bank CEOs and executives. All around the world, I got to work in Australia and Puerto Rico and all over the U.S. You know, really um, with the, the top management of uh, of major banks uh, from a very young age, and I just thought that was um, pretty pretty thrilling. Um, understanding their problems uh, and uh, and lots of smart people in the industry, all all well intentioned, all wanting to do um, you know right. Well, mostly wanting to do right by their customers. And, uh, and yet I saw some, some challenges uh, in the industry. I saw that they were relatively slow moving, uh, especially uh, around new technology. And, and I saw structural and regulatory reasons why that was the case. Um, I saw that in new product development projects, when we were talking about making change, um, and I did some product development for, for a number of banks, we could go through a six month engagement and know all the data on default rates and optimize prices and really understand internal transfer pricing and all these things and never talk to a customer. And, uh, and I thought that was um, interesting uh, and that, that there wasn't more customer uh, understanding and, and, and voice of the customer coming through. Um, and I would ask some executives, and I even asked one of the partners at my firm, and one of the partners said to me, well, John, there's some, some industries that make money off of money, and there's other industries that make money off of people, and we make money off of money. And, and, and the idea being that just optimize around the, the, the system, the internal data, and you'll, and you're, you're, you'll be fine uh, was, was pervasive. Um, and he wasn't wrong, um, but I, I wanted something different. I wanted to, to, to rebuild financial services around customers and not just the products that had already existed to that time, but to really reinvent things. I mean, when I was in Australia, I saw this, they have the mortgage offset product. And that's not something that we have here in America to this day, but I just thought that's such an interesting, innovative product that combines your deposit and, and mortgage accounts. Uh, and why don't we rethink financial services in, in the U.S.? And what do people really want? What's actually going to help people reach their goals? So I looked at a lot of different places uh, to be able to do that, a lot of different parts of financial services, and 
uh, and and one that I settled on was was investing, uh, and I can go on why, but I'm going to pause and take a breath. Well, it's uh, it's really interesting, and, and I'm glad that you and I are are connecting. I think we probably come at this in in a you know from a similar place in in a lot of ways. I mean, um, you know, I'm also very interested in, uh, personally in the the behavioral economics standpoint. Um, ha- have an investing background, um, you know, spent years, um, hands on investing, you know, working through things like CFA qualifications and, and all of the, you know, highly quantitative pieces of it. Uh, I, I think that the behavioral economics, uh, pieces is a more recent discovery for me. And it's, it's fun to think about effectively, you know, the, the human psychology specifically of retail investors, uh, when it comes to solving the problem of optimizing financial well-being, because whereas traditionally the idea was they're going to put you know a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or or ten million dollars wh- whatever the number in a portfolio of assets, and you're going to manage that to maximize the return. Well, actually, there's so much more to financial well-being than just uh, optimizing a portfolio return. You've seen deep into the mind of the the retail investor over the past number of years now. What's the biggest challenge faced by people when it comes to long-term financial well-being? And what tools are required to to address that? Well, of of course, uh, the question of what's the biggest challenge faced by by people long-term depends on what people. Uh, Everyone is different, and every individual has different challenges. And that's um, why... I think there's so many interesting different approaches to fintech and to, to consumer problems that you see emerging today because there are a lot of different problems and it's not really one size fits all. Um, we're coming into an age where there can be more uh, bespoke and personalized solutions for, for folks. And um, I, I, I listened um, uh, with joy to uh, uh, your interview with, um, with Ella from Scalable, as she was talking about, the personalization of, of portfolios that's that's coming, and that's very consistent with our own vision around how uh, every individual really has a, a different um, uh, set of constraints to optimize around, and we can do that now in a way that's better than mutual funds, it's better than ETFs, it's really truly personalized, and with great guidance about why this is the right answer for you and how you can improve your behavior. Um, to make a generalization, I mean, I, I really do believe every individual is different and has, and has different concerns. Income, you know, goes up and down, uh, is unpredictable. Uh, people with, uh, with debt have different concerns than people with, you know, excess, excess savings and money. Uh, people in America have different concerns than people in China. Uh, and between different states, we have different tax rates and all these kinds of things. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of personalization, but if I can generalize, one thing uh, that, that impacts a lot of people's lives quite a bit is planning and goals. And uh, when we think about, when we rank uh, order all the things that impact long-term financial well-being, in order of what you can control, the number one thing at the top of that list is savings rate. Personal savings rate is by far the biggest thing that you can do to impact your long-term financial happiness. Um, portfolio construction is near the bottom of that list uh, because no one can predict the future. No one knows whether Europe's going to grow faster than Asia or America or whatever. Um, There's lots of hypotheses, but no one knows these things. No one knows how stocks are going to perform relative to bonds. And uh, and so you want to be diversified, but there's, you know, a million different ways to diversify and all of them are kind of equally right, equally wrong. And there's not a clear, clear winner there. There's lots of stories about why one is better than the other. This one is risk parity or or this one is uh, value weighted or but, you know, by and large, these things have relatively minor impacts um, on your on your long term health. And, and what really matters is uh, savings rate, maybe also up there towards the top is optimizing around low reducing your fees, uh, optimizing around reducing your taxes, improving your behavior so that you're not market timing. Uh, those are things that you can very much control and people should be thinking about. And those are all things that, that we optimize around here at Betterment to help people manage better. You, you mentioned in an interview you did with the Financial Revolutionist, um, which is an excellent fintech resource, by the way, for those that don't know it, um, that 
advice is core to Betterment's model. And, um, you know, there, there, there are different takes on the robo-advisory business model, uh, what, it's, what it's meant to do, the best way to deploy AI and machine learning and automation into to retail portfolio management. But can, can you just expand on that, uh, that point around advice and, and what it means for Betterment? When you asked what is what is Betterment at the at the top of the show, I said it's uh, it's it's excellent guidance available to everyone, uh, made human and, and, and accessible. That's the core of our vision: is uh, is that guidance is the future of financial services. I could broaden that out. I actually think that guidance is an important part of all technologies. We think about um, what we can do with, uh, say, narrow. Um, uh, AI uh, in in various spaces and, and just application of technology. Let's just like like demystify AI, just like with better algorithms. Um, well, we can give advice around you know what what else might you like to buy. We can give advice about, around what might you like to read about. We can give advice around um, uh, what you might like to watch next. We can give advice around how might you like to get from point A to point B. Do you want the fastest route? Do you want the most fuel efficient route? Do you want to walk? Do you want to bike? Um, there's great advice around all of these kinds of things that's just getting better and better thanks to technology. And financial services is a place where people need lots of advice. It's super complicated. It's, uh, and we're talking about a realm where uh, people are just bad at this. People are bad at planning. People are bad at thinking about, you know, if I ask you what do you, you know, um, uh, want to do next year, it's tough, much less thinking about 30 years from now and sort of retirement time horizons or paying for college, you know. 10 or 15 years from now for, for your kids. People are really bad at thinking about these long-term things, but technology can pretty quickly calculate what are the impacts and trade-offs and how do you how do you have to change your behavior today to have the outcome that you want in the future? So financial planning and guidance around it and the interrelationships between decisions. If I save more on this, am I better off? If I buy insurance instead of buying, uh, instead of investing it, how does that impact my long-term financial picture? Gosh, financial, you know, we're, we're, we're moving fast uh, toward having really a holistic picture of everything and an understanding of how all these products um, relate. And, uh, and I believe that's, uh, it's what everyone sees it. So, you know, I'm not, you know, by revealing our, our roadmap and our vision, I don't feel like I'm uh, being super original. I just think that we're in the best position to execute on it. Is technology alone sufficient to provide the guidance that you're talking about? Or is there a need for a human component at this point? Um, well, historically, it's been uh, only through a human that you can get you know, the, these kinds of planning services, right? If we go back, um, well, even even now, some of the stuff that, that, that we're talking about, you can only get through uh, through talking to, to, to an advisor, right? Um, and it's still a fairly manual process. We've automated a ton of really powerful services that until you know, five years ago or even last year were only accessible by a, a more manual uh, process. So we've automated tax loss harvesting. We've automated asset location, uh, which is an incredible thing, right? We can shield your dividends for you. We can tell you how much you should put into your Roth and which assets should be in your Roth versus your traditional IRA. Big differences in outcomes um, you know, uh, for, for people uh, based on those kinds of decisions. And, uh, and it's almost impossible to do manually, or it's very expensive, I should say, to, to, to do manually, to, to do all that analysis. So we made people a lot of money and saved people a lot of money by making great guidance accessible um, and, and human readable and, and, and efficient. So we're automating as, as, as much as we can, and, uh, and we're learning from, uh, from our on-staff uh, financial experts who chat with customers about what else they want us to automate, what else we can, we can build. Uh, but there are, are, are of course, uh, places where humans still have a lot of value to provide, and uh, one of them is in uh, is in uh, conversations and relationships and explanations. Um, you know, we have a lot of customers who just want to better understand what we do or how something works. And you know, you can write a blog post about it. You can have real time uh, feedback in the app about how that thing works. But sometimes some people just want to have it explained to them, or maybe they have a question that's you know sort of unusual. Um, sometimes people just don't like to read, frankly. And for them, you know, to have someone they can talk to about it and better understand it and get comfortable with the technology, boy, that's immensely valuable. And if that helps them save more money and uh, and live a live a happier life, 
well, it's worth every penny to, to provide that, that service to them. I don't think that's going away ever. I don't think it's going away in our lifetimes. People are people like talking to other people, uh, and uh, and there's there's value in those in those relationships and conversations. Yeah, there are there are a number of different wealth tech business models around, from PFMs, personal financial managers, to advice focused robo advisors, to robo offerings from incumbent investment managers. Is there a complete solution in the market? And if not, what what would it look like? Is there a complete? Uh, uh, investment management solution in the market. I think here there are different um, different segments of customers, and there's you know things that uh, serve maybe certain segments completely. I feel like for someone with say uh, you know a hundred thousand dollars to um, a couple million dollars. I felt confident saying there's nothing better you could do with your money than put it in a betterment account, right? It's a, it's a complete solution in that sense. We do all the things that you want to do. But there's going to be people who, um, you know, have, have different needs and, and preferences. And uh, while we may be the best thing for 80% of, of people um, and, uh, and continue to, to take on more and more personalization and, and more of those, those corner cases, you know, it, it takes a while until, until you get to 100% coverage. So <laughs> we're, we're, working, we're working that way. We're working to, to, to serve as many customers as we can. What are, the, what are the economics of a B2C robo-advisor look like? Is it all about scaling AUM in an ever more competitive price environment, or is there more to it? I think here, too, there are different models, right? There are some models that are driven by per customer fees. Um, you see that maybe some in, uh, in 401ks where, uh, you know, the participants maybe have uh, lower assets on average. And so you have dollar flat fees. Um, there are pay for service models where you have a flat dollar financial plan um, and assets managed free or cheaply. Uh, you have uh, AUM models. I think there's I think there's still going to continue to be a bunch of different different pricing models in this space. The, the ones that are most popular, the AUM uh, uh, based e models, are I think most popular because that's what customers tend tend to prefer today. We listen to our customers, right? And so we kind of want to uh, optimize around what's what's right for our customers. And are the current fee structures sustainable given AUM growth? Oh yeah, I mean, um, I I think I think you'll probably see fee, you'll see fee compression. You'll, like we're seeing fee compression in asset management uh, every year, right? Like the the average um, uh, asset management fee is is uh, is down, you know, twenty percent over the last ten years or something like this. And of course, it always depends on which market and what you're counting and whatnot. But uh, there's fee compression there. The fee for advice hasn't undergone uh, as much compression, but I think that with technology, technology creates efficiency and, and it allows you to do things more more efficiently. And uh, you know, ultimately, uh, what what drives the market price is is cost. Uh, and uh, and as we continue to drive cost out of out of our model, I think we can uh, continue to drive more value back to back to customers, uh, either in the form of more and better services or, uh, or, or lower prices. I think our, our, our vision is to continue to invest in our, in our offering. Uh, and you can give that money back either by, uh, by improving the, the optimizations and, and the integrations and the, and the holistic picture or, or, or by cutting costs. There's, there's different ways of, of doing it. Naturally, a lot of the public view of robo-advisory businesses and, and increasingly automated investment management is you know, comes from B2C focused players, at least B2C propositions. But there's also a ton of activity in the, the B2B space, uh, you know, new, new software, new technology to support traditional investment managers. Uh, is, is that in your view, a, um, an interesting place to, to focus? Is that, is that something that, uh, that Betterman does at all? Yes, we have we have two B two B businesses. Uh, so we have Betterment for advisors, 
and there we support uh, thousands of, of advisors who use the Betterment platform for uh, the consumer apps, for the uh, for all the uh, advisor tools and rebalancing and, and portfolio optimization and things that that we provide. Uh, and uh, and then we also have the Betterment for Business offering which is a 401k, a workplace uh, offer uh, that, that provides a great, uh, a, great, a great option for employers who want to give personalized financial advice to every one of their employees. At, by the way, you know, uh, an all-in low cost that's, that's lower than the average for you know, 401k, legacy 401k providers who, who don't give any of that personalized financial guidance. Where do you see most room for kind of short to intermediate term growth across those three parts of the business, the two B2B and, and the B2C? Consumer remains the, 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 the lion's share of our business uh, and by nature of being the biggest, um, even if the, the growth rates of the other businesses are higher, um, uh, just the, the, the scale of it means that it's going to be growing much, growing larger more, more quickly than, than those other mm-hmm. businesses. Mm-hmm. How, how do you how do you continue to build betterment from here? I mean, how is it is it a more comprehensive reach across asset classes and account types, or is it I don't know an enhanced B two B emphasis or or something else? So, uh, yes and and yes, uh, there's a lot to do. It's really it, it feels like day one. It feels like we now have this opportunity to do so much. You know, we've we've arrived and. and so many things that, that I believe we can improve uh, and continue to, uh, to to drive value. Big themes for us are guidance, which we talked about at, at length, but continuing to integrate your your full financial life uh, so that you're really in control across all things, um, just with your betterment account. You have a great sense of being on track around all of your fin- financial life. Uh, that's that to me is true holistic guidance, and we can we can continue to iterate there, and gosh, just make it um, more and more accessible to people, um, more personalized to people. Uh, so, a second major theme beyond guidance is personalization. There's we can personalize across so many vectors. Uh, you know, the, the the way your portfolio is constructed is one way of talking about personalization. So. If you're in New York, you get New York muni bonds. If you're in California, you get California muni bonds. Like those are forms of personalization. Or uh, you know, we now offer uh, the, the world's best socially responsible portfolio. Uh, and some people want something socially responsible, so that's an option that you have at, at Betterment. It's a way to personalize. But we're we're doing more and more to personalize uh, uh, portfolios and, and around your views and values and your your life. Um, our whole goal, goal-based platform is personalized. The way you sign up with us and the experience that you have uh, should be personalized to you. The more we learn about you, the, the, the better tailored our communication should be to you. And in a way, just being really good at, at these important services that we provide is our vision. Uh, and, and being good at them is a, it's a, you know, we're, we're so early in that. Like, I think we're amazing. I think we're the best in marketing. I think we're great at it. But Gosh, there's so much more that we can do, and we can make it just better and better and better, and feel more like uh, this necessary uh, utility. Because if you don't have it, you're just you're just wasting money. All right. So stepping back a little bit and thinking a bit more broadly about kind of what your entrepreneurial experience has been like, uh, and, and also you know the the broader market dynamic at this point. What um, what, what are you What are you most excited about in fintech right now? Um, well, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but <laughs> I'm most excited about what AI. I, I hate to use the words AI because they're so loaded, but just what you know, better uh, technology and 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 algos and personalization can do around financial guidance. Um, and I don't think I'm alone in, in focusing there, right? I think that's the same place that uh, J.P. Morgan is focused. I think it's the same place that, let's say, uh, BlackRock uh, is is focused. Uh, maybe we're talking about different customers, but I think there's kind of a convergence on this idea that, gosh, we have all this interesting 
data on our customers and what are we doing with all of that to help make their lives better? And there's so much we can do. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think we're just kind of scratching, scratching the surface of that. So that's really exciting to me. If you were starting Betterment again today, what would you do differently? Tough. I, I think uh, in, the, in the early, I mean, you know, it's tough because I feel like we've been so lucky and, uh, and you change anything and you don't know if you'd have that, that same luck. You know, I feel like I've, um, I've been lucky to work with amazing people all along the way. We've, we've made some, some great hires and, and they've done uh, incredible things here. Uh, we've, uh, we've found great investors uh, and they've been amazing, amazing partners to us. Uh, so when, when things are going well, it's, it's hard to say, what, what would you change? Because even the mistakes are like, well, you know, we learned something from that. And I'm glad we learned it when we did. Uh, when, um, when I started, I thought for a while, uh, oh, I'm just going to do this all on my own. And, uh, and that was a, you know, like I had sort of an embarrassing thing to admit. It was, it was like pretty, pretty naive. And I could have realized early on, just, I'm going to need to build a big company. I'm going to need to like hire a lot of people and, and do, uh, and, and, and find partners and, and build this out. Obviously I got there, right. <laughs> but, uh, but, but for a while, as I was planning, I just really thought I was going to code and manage the entire thing myself. Uh, so mm-hmm. thankfully I've now, I've now built a, a, an amazing, amazing team, uh, mm-hmm. on the journey with me. Mm-hmm. Well, a potentially related question, but um, what what advice would you have for someone starting a fintech company? You know, the best advice that uh, that I like to give came from my uh, my co-founder Sean Owen, who said to me once early on, uh, Sean Sean was like our my, my first engineer, um, uh, and he was my roommate at the time, um, and he said, just make it real, uh, focus on the things that are going to make this idea real as quickly as possible. Uh, so maybe an example at the time was I was uh, working on uh, on building out a graph uh, to show how your, how your money would grow over time, the projection graph that I think now lots of people have implemented. We were the first to, to build that kind of a graph that shows like, you know, given expected return and volatility, how things are going to grow. It's, it's a part of every robo these days. But I thought that was a really interesting idea, and I wanted to make it real and show it to people and show what I meant by kind of a different type of financial tool that was built around what, what people wanted to see and would give them guidance about the future. Uh, and, you know, I think Sean liked that, but he also pushed me on, that's great, but, you know, you also got to build a sign-up process, right? Like, you're going to have to build out the sign-up flow, and it's important to make it real in that way, right? Like, give, make it happen. Make, make the things that are necessary and then build the embellishments and, and get, the, get the basics right. Uh, and, 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 you know, another example is have a, have a business card that has your phone number on it and your, and your name. And I know that's silly and maybe people are like, oh, who needs business cards? But it makes it real. It's like a little thing that's like, no, we're doing this. Like we're, we're committed. We're, we're in it. Um, and, and here's our company and it's tangible. Uh, so making it, making it real in all the ways is, uh, is a, is a thing that I like to always say to, to other founders. I like that. Um, maybe, um, T- totally uh, different subject just to wrap up, but um, I've come to fintech and, and really kind of spent most of my time in, in the space uh, here in London. And you guys are based in Chelsea, I believe, the, the Manhattan Chelsea. Um, what's the fintech scene like in New York? How would you describe it? I'd say it's Thriving, we have uh, a number of fintech companies uh, in a you know one and two block radius right right around the office here. So there's lots of, of energy around it. Um, tech in New York, gosh, uh, when I was starting out ten years ago, it was still you know you could kind of know everyone <laughs> really who was who was in the tech community. It was a small a small world or a small pond. Um, and it was always a topic of conversation. Uh, thankfully, I don't hear that conversation anymore. And I, I, I don't even think it's like New York and SF or, you know, whatever, like the way it's just like, tech is a thing everywhere. Um, mm. This is one of the, the hubs of it. So it's been nice to see that that evolution. It, it, it makes it um, 
easier to attract talent here. It probably also makes the, the talent market more competitive because every every uh, tech company wants to have a New York outpost now just because it's, it's a great place to live. People want to be here. Uh, and so and the best employees in the country have the option of, of building a tech career in, in New York. And it's great. It's great for the city and it's great for, for the people who want to live here. And and what about the uh, the relationship, the dynamic with Wall Street and and incumbent banks? Well, it's nice to be close to all of them. Uh, I I feel lucky to have relationships with a lot of uh, CEOs of major asset managers and banks and 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 large large financial institutions. I just. And, and small, right? Like I, I like knowing the, the the founders and CEOs of all the fintech companies because I, I I believe that uh, a rising tide lifts all ships, and uh, and we're seeing innovation in financial services that allows us to provide a lot more value than uh, than, than than we have in the past to really better impact people's lives. You know, I see ads uh, sometimes about um, financial services companies that uh, old line companies that show like people on the beach and like, you know, and it's like, wouldn't it be nice if your you know, financial service company could help you have this? And I think about that company and I think, yeah, what are they doing? They're giving you a lo- They're giving you a mortgage. How does that get you there? It's not really clear. To, you know, you have to kind of imagine a lot of steps in between to connect those dots. Um, but I feel like we're help, we're starting to better connect the dots. We're starting to actually help people better map. And of course, there's unpredictability in life, uh, maybe more than more more chance and luck than uh, than than not. But we can we can set people up to better manage their life of of income and opportunities and risks uh, to to make the most of it, and and so that they don't have to worry about financial services. It's just a, a utility that's provided to them. Uh, anyway, that was a long, uh, a long answer to uh, why am I excited about having other financial services companies around. But it's great to have relationships with all of them and, and to be able to bounce some of these ideas. Yeah, no. Yeah, well, in, in that case, it sounds pretty similar to to London. Just a you know really kind of positive um, you know community feel. Uh, we should catch up with some I don't know people in other fintech hubs at some point and and understand what it's like there. But nice look. Uh, really appreciate your time today. John, what's the best way for people to find out more about Betterment and the, the ideas we talked about today? Well, uh, Betterment.com is a, is a great source for all things Betterment. You can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on Instagram. You can, uh, you can read our, our blog. Uh, but the, really, the best thing to do is just sign up, right? There's no fee for signing up as a customer. You can start to see our emails and understand the experience that we're building and the guidance that we give. Excellent. John Stein, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Will. Great to be here. Thanks for tuning in to Rebank. If you like today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com.